turns out that we actually more recently have some models that are using this uh, pattern of connectivity to understand how the brain might do predictive learning. These circuits might be driving an ability to learn by predicting what's going to happen next and then seeing what happens next and learning basically on that difference. And output project, uh, projections driving attention and uh, focusing uh, and modulating the kind of sensory input that you're getting in a kind of top-down way so that you have sort of top-down control over the kind of sensory inputs that you're receiving. So these are some of the interesting kind of ideas you can see uh, when you just look at the basic circuitry and think about, well, what, what would that projection here possibly do? How can we make sense of that? So this is our basic template for understanding processing in the neocortex. And as we can see, it makes a lot of sense. You got to get sensory input, you got to do something with it, and you got to generate uh, important kind of outputs from that. So each of those kind of makes sense independently. Uh, here's a diagram showing you the patterns of connectivity among these different areas. And these uh, distinct patterns of connectivity allow us to really understand how the brain is organized across different areas of the, of the cortex. Because there's a distinctive pattern of connectivity that's different for feed-forward projections as compared to feedback projections. And so this, anou this allows us to identify essentially uh, a pathway of feed forward projections hierarchically organized going from one to the next, that's how we know that those areas are actually kind of hierarchically connected because they're having this pattern of feed forward connections as compared to the feedback projections, which um, almost inevitably are also present and reciprocally uh, connected. So if you have an area that sends a feed-forward projection, it receives also this kind of feedback projection. And specifically, the feed-forward projections uh, originate from those layer two, three superficial layer, hidden layer neurons that we've kind of coded in blue here. And they send projections, interestingly, up into layer four of the next area above. So if this is, for example, primary visual cortex here, area V1, um, it is now sending its pathway, uh, its projections into the layer four of area V2, the next layer up in the kind of visual processing hierarchy. Layer four should receive those inputs, and in fact it does. Because our models primarily simulate these hidden layers, this allows us to kind of capture that feedforward flow of information all within these kind of superficial layer circuits. In contrast, the feedback originates from uh, the um, deep layers as well as the superficial layers. So uh, again, now if we're thinking about this as V2, this is now sending projections or connectivity back down to uh, lower layers, and that's originating uh, from superficial layers and from deep layers. And it turns out, as you look more in more detail, um, as you go higher up in the cortex, more of the projections from higher areas originate from the deep layers of those areas. Um, as you get kind of further away and higher up in the hierarchy, more of the projections originate in the deep layers relative to the superficial layers. When you're kind of a close by area, it's more evenly balanced. Lastly, there are lateral connections. So these are, area, these are connections within a given brain area. So for example, if this is V1, this is now V1 in one part of V1 connecting to another part of V1. And these look a lot like the feedback projections, uh, except that they also target kind of all of the different areas more uniformly. And so that's a, a, a kind of distinct pattern of connectivity as well based on, on the terminals. Um, and these lateral connections we'll end up looking at a lot in our visual chapter when we see how the brain organizes information into a topography, a kind of spatial organization of information across the neurons within a given area. But often, in fact, we don't include them in our models, again, as a way to simplify. Our models are small enough, and we don't really need that kind of organized uh, arrangement of the information. And this is a diagram of the uh, hierarchical connectivity, again, identified specifically based on those differential patterns of connectivity um, so we have uh, V1 going up to V2, going then up to V4, v, uh, V3, V4, TEO, TE, and TH. These are all areas in the infratemporal lobe. Um, and this area, this 
projection is really uh, concentrating the what information, the identification of visual objects um, in the ventral visual pathway. And so you can actually kind of see that there's these further, in addition to there being a hierarchy, there's also kind of an organization of these two different visual pathways. Um, and the other side over here, the, the, the information splits off into the parietal lobe and the dorsal visual pathway. And again, we'll talk more about this in the uh, perception chapter. And all of these areas are important for processing uh, motion and spatial information and action related information um, based on visual inputs. And that hierarchical pattern of connectivity is really important for understanding how higher levels of these hierarchies are able to represent more abstract, high-level information. That's kind of the key principle that we use to understand how the cortex gets smart. Um, another really important feature, which I alluded to, is that the, the brain is bi-directionally connected. So whenever you do have one of those feed-forward pathways going up from one area to another, so for example, from V1 to V2, you also have a reciprocal projection from V2 coming back down to V1. And so when you look at this diagram, the diagonal here is, is the area connected to itself and all areas have self connections, these lateral connections to, to, to themselves. But what you wanna look for is this essentially this kind of folding symmetry, this, if you were to take this as a piece of paper and kind of fold it along that diagonal and to the extent these different areas kind of line up with each other, that tells you that there's bi-directional symmetry, that, that an, when an area sends information to that area, it receives a reciprocal connection back. And by and large, that's true. It's actually kind of interesting to see which areas don't have the bi-directional symmetry, because that's more of the exception rather than the rule, and that might be providing some interesting information.